Annette, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So one of the things, Annette, that that you've said to me before that really struck me is that you said in order for the sport to evolve, we need to evolve collectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does evolve in that sense mean to you? What Mm. is the most important part of that statement? I think it's it's about um, getting to know ourselves better, um, self development, if you want to call it that. But it's I think um, the sport is is really it is evolving, and I can still see how um, we are sometimes looking for answers in an area that is um helpful but not crucial and um so for example um searching for you know a better bit or a better training system or a better uh aid um oftentimes what i'm learning through the conversations with my clients is that 80% of the time it's about diving deeper inside and I always call it like it's it's the the flat work training that our horses need we kind of need the basics too and return to those basics at times and so what does that mean it's not that philosophical but what it comes down to is that we dare to tune in Mm -hmm. and that we dare to listen and um and similarly, I think that is also what helps us connect better with our horses, with other beings, with trainers. Um, so yeah, like developing ourselves so we can become better horse people and, and, and people in general. It's an interesting thing about our sport that's very unique to unique to us. And that is that working in partnership and in relationship with these extremely sensitive, sentient beings Mm. requires a different level of responsibility for us as athletes in our own development. And there are parallels, I think in, in a lot of, you know, team sports, you could, um, you could point to teammates holding each other accountable for bringing a positive attitude being the, their best selves, putting in the work, um, not letting their uh, ego become unchecked, all of those sorts of things. But we almost have to be more in tune with that side of ourselves as riders because our horses can't really call bullshit on us. Mm. Um, they can in small ways, but not in a let's face it, most of us need sometimes to be hit in the face with something or to be told like, you can't act like that. Um, Sometimes we don't pick up on those smaller, um, more soft suggestions that we should do so. And so really, I think so much of what you're speaking to is it's, it's an unspoken responsibility that we have because we are in partnership with animals Mm. and other sports don't do that. Uh, Yeah, I I agree. And I, I would add to that. I like, I think it's a a responsibility we all have. Mm -hmm. If you're working with beings as human beings, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we want to be there for, first of all, ourselves, for the people around us, for our family, for our children, you know, if, if I don't do that in a work, I can't be there in the same way. You know, if I, if I had not done the internal work that I have and I would still be mentally like my 20 year old self, goodness me, you know, like my daughter <laughs> would be in a very different place right now. So, um, and similarly, I often, you know, realize and also sometimes discuss with my clients, like, yeah, for them, I have the responsibility to be the best version of myself, to keep doing the work myself, to notice when my bullshit stories come up and make me feel small or whatever, to call them out and say, no, not that. I'm not going to listen to that. That is a responsibility, not a luxury. And, and, and indeed, for our horses, I believe that they do tell us, but we don't often listen. 
because mm-hmm. we're so in our head, right? Hmm. And that you work with so many humans that are very successful and at just the top echelons of the sport. Um, and I'm curious, I'm curious what your observations are, if you sort of 30,000 foot view, do you think that there's kind of a common denominator in terms of personality or mindset for the riders who make it to the top of the sport? And I suppose, you know, it doesn't even have to just be riders. It can also be uh, grooms. It could also be vets. It could be coaches, people that are what so many other people who participate in the sport aspire to get to. Is there, do you think that the top of the sport is populated by a certain type of person? No, I, what I've learned talking to many, um, mostly riders um, at the top of the sport and in general in the sport, what I've learned is that they're all human. Yeah. What I mean by that is, you know, when I set out to interview the riders for my book, Winning Habits, I somehow expected you know I always looked up to these writers like Laura Crowd like McLean like um, Daniel Doiser you know like these writers were my idols and looking up to them I, I kind of expected somehow that they were different that they uh yeah, like you not, had to just you just had to probe enough to like uncover the yeah, reason that they exactly, were exactly exactly and and yet when I spoke to them what I realized was they're human too just like you and me you know and they have made mistakes and they still make mistakes and they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses they've had incredibly successful moments and they've had deep deep uh, moments of of doubt. You know, speaking to Jeroen Dumbledum, like he's won every single championship there is to win in the show jumping sport, in the equestrian sport in general. And, you know, he told me about a phase that he went through at some stage in his career where it was really about getting to the next level. Whether he was really aware of it at the time, I'm not sure, but it was really, you know, it was really rethinking completely how he approached his horses and his training. And he decided to embark on that. And, you know, that journey took two years. And in that time, you know, I asked him, I said, was there a time where you felt like giving up or how was that? He said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I either I felt like going back to how things were. I, you know, I came from winning or being placed almost every weekend and horses coming in and out to now really thinking about the long run and the long term process with the horse and teaching the horses things and being patient with that and coming home with one, two, three down every week. That was hard. And I really felt like sometimes, oh, I should go back or I should just quit altogether. So what I'm trying to say is, and and by the way, you know, not long after he came out the other end, he won Olympic gold. So it was clearly very effective for him. But what I'm, what I'm trying to suggest is that we are all human. And um, what I've learned is that we, the, the more we rise, the more people have opinions about us, um, sometimes judgments about us. And what I like to do is to help show that all these writers, no matter what level we're at, we're all just human beings. And we all have the potential and the choice to grow, to adjust, And to keep looking at what works for me and what doesn't. And from that place, keep adjusting to increase what works and to let go of what doesn't. It's, it's, I know it's really simplified, but that is what it comes down to. You know, it's not about what other people are doing that works for them. It's about looking inward and looking really honestly, the feedback you're getting from your rounds, from what's happening in your life you know, where do I need to make the adjustment? And I think that is what these writers are very good at. They're very clear of where they want to be, where they want to get to. And then it's just constantly looking at where am I now, not from a place of, 
oh, it's not good enough, but from a place of this is great and that's where I'm going. And constantly looking at, well, how am I going to get there? What's required? What's needed? And working on that. One of the things that you just said there was that having the clarity to understand what works for you and what doesn't is very important. Mm -hmm. That in and of itself, to me... (laughs) is harder than it would sound like, oh, I just take what works and then I just toss away what doesn't. Sure. Mm -hmm. That sounds really simple. I think so many people who are listening to this podcast think, I don't even have the clarity to know and to make a judgment call on whether something is working for me or not. Mm -hmm. Where does that ability come from? I think it's about simplifying. For example, I think we all know, we've all experienced that tuning into our horses, really being present, really being there works. I think we've all as equestrians have at some stage realized how powerful it is when we really, really listen. We also all, I'm certain that we all know deep down why we're doing it because we love horses and yet it's so easy to forget these core principles if you want to call it that Mm -hmm. and um, I guess what I do as a coach is to kind of help simplify what do we need to return to what what works for you for example I work with a lot of driven, ambitious riders and their strength is working hard, always, you know, never giving up, always continuing, always finding, you know, a way forward, a way to improve. And what I've learned over time is that sometimes being so focused on constantly doing more that they forget the, the simple things that actually make the difference. So working, what I've seen a lot is working towards championships or an important show, um, or maybe that's, I don't know, working towards being hired at a certain stable. We feel like we need to suddenly do more. We need to be perfect. And now it needs to all work out. And yet as a result of that, we tend to get in our head get very rational, work harder. And though that can be powerful and that can really contribute to growth, and I don't disregard it, uh, what I'm suggesting is what makes the difference when you're riding really, really well, when you're really your best version of you, is when you're really connected, not disconnected. And so going back to what works is doing that on a consistent basis, checking in with yourself regularly, really tuning in and feeling. Every time you get on the horse, tuning in, feeling your horse underneath you. These are basic principles that for some riders are common sense and they don't even think about it. And other riders, they've kind of somewhere down the, li- like down the lane, they've forgotten about it. Because you know, we want to do so well. It's not from a a bad place, but it's just, you know, sometimes we just simply forget. And so, yes, it might seem complicated. In reality, it can be very simple, but it's really letting go of all the noise, figuring out, and again, how, how do we get there? You know, I believe it's, it's, it's the more we tune in, and, and again, this is really about, you know, you can grasp it right now listening to me on a rational level, but I suggest that you apply it for a week, sit down every morning just for five minutes, get still, you will still have thoughts and that's okay, You're not. it's not about right or wrong, it's just about sitting there, feeling, go back to feeling your body, you can start with just feeling your breath, it's again, it's not about, oh, now I can't think anything. You will. I mean, we have roughly 60,000 thoughts a day. There will be thoughts that come by and that's fine. You notice it and you go back. 
And just that tuning in every day as consistent work, you, you don't need to get anything out of it straight away. But after a week, you can observe, is there anything I've noticed by doing this? Mm-hmm. And the same thing, the same exercise you can apply with your horse. In fact, what I've recently kind of rediscovered is that it's equally important that we do this work for ourselves as well as for our horse. And we really check in this way with our horse. And that, I think, is, you know, you spoke about responsibility earlier. I think that is a rider's responsibility to really check in with yourself, with your horse, and tune in to what, what's there. Not from a place of judgment or I need to fix it. or It's just observing what is there. And from that place, you will start to listen and, and hear what is required, what is working for me and what isn't. Mm. We tend to often want to do so much and we feel like, oh, in order for me to, to do better and to get to the next level, I need to read these books and I need to get that course. And, I, and yes, I mean, obviously, these things are incredibly important and I highly recommend. That's why I write books. But at the same time, in addition... I suggest that we also tune into the wisdom we have inside already. Hmm. The way that the student and trainer relationship is often structured is that there's sort of a giver of information and then there's the recipient of the information. Mm -hmm. And that, not always, but often Mm -hmm. that format inherently may interfere with our ability to be really connected with what we are feeling because, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I've certainly experienced this myself and heard lots of other people talk about it too. At a certain point, when we are trying to advance ourselves as riders, we think, okay, well, I, I really need to, to listen to what my trainer says. I really need to bring it. I really need to like, level up my game, you know, in my lessons, like, you know, she asks for heels down. I, I put them down an inch more than she, you know, thought I could, you know, that sort of thing, like overachieving in that way. And what sometimes I think many of us experience in that student trainer relationship is we begin to ride as a performance of our greatness for our trainer. So we begin to, we begin to ride in a way that isn't really in tune with our bodies and our horses, but is more thinking about my trainer is, is giving me these instructions and I'm going to prove to her that I can do it or prove to him that I can do it. And it almost becomes a little bit performative. Um, and having been in a number of performing types of roles in my life, I, I know that uh, you can be acting in a performative way and completely forget that, you know, my name is Caroline. I have blue eyes. I'm wearing black pants. Like completely even just forget that you're in your own body because you're so focused on the output and how you're being perceived. And those things are in intention with what you're saying, which is connecting to yourself, connecting to your horse. And I want to I want to talk a little bit about the student trainer relationship here because it really is sort of like the nucleus of the sport. So many of us, the way that we experience horses is a reflection, or at least in coordination with that student trainer relationship. It is very important. Actually, the first episode that we ever taped of this podcast is specifically on the student trainer relationship. Um, It's where the standards of horsemanship are set. It's where the treatment of the horse is set. It's where the treatment of each other is set. It's where goal setting, overall tone, energy, what kinds of interactions are we going to have? All of those things are sort of set within the boundaries, the circle of the student trainer relationship. And it can be a really big detriment or um, cultivator of confidence 
for the student, maybe even actually for the trainer, I suppose. Talk to me about this. Talk Mm. to me about maybe what the optimal student trainer relationship would look like that would allow Mm. us to not just perform for our trainers, but ride in a way that we're really connected with ourselves and with our horses. Mm. How long have you got? (laughs) (laughs) All day Uh, for you. (laughs) Always. I mean, I <clears throat> I think this is a really important topic. Um, and I would add, you know, I think it's a formative time for the, the, the as a person, right? Because often most of us, we start writing when we are young, right? Child, uh, teenager, uh, and, and those are very formative years. So yeah, absolutely. It's a very important relationship in an ideal world. Um I believe that there are certain, again, principles that that hopefully are there. Um, and, and what do I mean by that? First of all, I think the the relationship should start with, you know, a basis of, of, of respect. Uh, respect, I think, is incredibly important um, in, in that relationship. Um, and I think... Uh, the space uh, is another one for for the student to make mistakes. I think a lot of trainers often say, oh, she's so scared of making mistakes. And then when I listen to how she's being trained, there is no space for that student to make mistakes because straight away people are on it and we're taught how, you know, how that was wrong. And, um, and so... In an ideal world, I think trainers are not only educated in what works for a horse and what a horse needs to jump well or perform well, but also are educated in what works in, in, in the human brain. And that is something that, you know, from my perspective, I come from the show jumping sport. I've witnessed and I, you know, most of my clients are either in in show jumping, some in dressage, eventing, but most in those disciplines, I still come across a lot of trainers that, you know, come from a place of judgment as soon as mistakes are being made. And um, uh, from a a, a point of view, you know, like uh, how what worked for them as a writer in the past or in the present. And though that is effective for them, that might not be so effective for their student. And so I think, you know, if a, a level of, of understanding what works at what age, what is appropriate, how quick do we go? You know, I, my personal experience was that my trainers, they went up way too quick. I had not set any basics yet and we were already on to the next and so my basics have never really consolidated. And mm. so you, you will have to catch up later. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that can relate to that. So I think it, it depends on the stage and the age that you're in. Uh, I think in the beginning as a student, yes, there will be an interaction where the, the coach is telling you what to do because you have no experience. You have very little knowledge. That is very helpful. Now, there comes a moment where after, you know, say, 8, 9, 10, 15 years, you start to develop your own thoughts, your own thinking, and your own intuition. You now have 10,000s of hours of experience. And so is your relationship with your trainer able to evolve? And what does that mean? Now, if you think of the model where you have a... Um, a teacher or a, a trainer uh, being the, the parent role telling you what to do and the student is a child role right they listen and they obey let's say um, uh, what evolving might mean is that the student grows into being an adult and quite frankly that often is the case you know around 18, 19, 20, uh, it's an age, you know, some clients that I work with are in that age and, and they're transitioning from, from child to adult. And it is paramount that the coach is, is A, aware of this transition and be able to work with that transition. Now, 
sometimes it can be perceived as, hey, this student suddenly thinks that they know it all or that they think they know better. And it's, again, being judged. I think it's a real great shame because at the end of the day, we want to teach people to think for themselves, to trust their instinct, to trust feeling the horse. That's what we want to cultivate. And yet when they do that, we straight away tell them off. I'm, you know, I'm talking very black or white here. You might not be that kind of trainer. Great. Good for you. I'm very pleased to hear it. But there are, I'm afraid, still a lot of trainers that are very focused on wanting to get it right too. And that too comes from a very noble, good place. And it's not always very effective. So what does that mean? I, I believe that in order to evolve in that way, trainers as well as students need to keep educating themselves in how they can better teach, right? So it's, it's, it's the responsibility of the student to, um, to evolve and to take responsibility and to start thinking for themselves. And it's also the responsibility of the trainer to facilitate that space for the student to do so. Hmm. Do you think, I, you know, when you, when you were speaking about how there, there comes a time where, where that relationship becomes a little bit more interactive and that it almost sounds like that feels in some ways threatening to the trainer. And it's almost Mm -hmm. like, I wonder if we could kind of reframe that in our heads, um, that it's actually an achievement Mm. for the trainer to have Mm -hmm. a student who all of a sudden is like, we're going to, we're, we're going to become more interactive here. Mm -hmm. It's not Mm -hmm. going to be a giver and a receiver, but can we inch towards having a more reciprocal relationship? I mean, in so many ways that, that is because you've done a good job. Absolutely. I think that's a really uh, good point there. And yes, I agree. I think, yes, sometimes again, I'm assuming here, but, but I, I do indeed believe that oftentimes trainers might feel a little threatened and indeed let's reframe that and indeed realize like what, again, there too, you, as a trainer, you can look at what, what do I want for my student? Where do I want my students to get to? And in order for it to succeed and to achieve its goals, it, you know, there are certain things that we know are, are important. And that evolution of daring to trust themselves, daring to really tune in, listen, uh, to stand up, to make their own decisions, that is the, the fact that they feel confident enough to do so is, is something to celebrate. Absolutely. And I wonder if, if maybe we can take that a step further and, and see if as trainers, we can work towards that and encourage that and um, again make space for that uh, uh, and, and, and any transition what is really important is any transition comes with chaos so in that evolution of transitioning from a child to an adult now if we just look at our own lives that did not happen one day to the next that did not happen in a very smooth way hey there it's rocky it's it's messy it's chaotic it's you know there's hormones involved it's you know it's not always comfortable and yet that is part of growth and so we as trainers should not be afraid of that we should encourage it and we should just be prepared for it Mm -hmm. and even maybe communicate it hey i noticed this is what's going on tell me, tell me about it. So opening again, the space for the student to be heard, to be respected, to be allowed to be who they really are, instead of molded into who you think they should be. Hmm. Tell me about that are maybe four of the most powerful words, I think that (laughs) that uh, you can probably say, um, you know, just even human to human, just mm. to uh, to to really hold space for somebody else's experience, not exactly. what you think that they're experiencing. Exactly. 
what is the responsibility of the student in this relationship and mm-hmm. how can we be better learners as students? Mm-hmm. What yeah. do we need to bring to the table? Yeah. So um, in order for us students to really make the most of the experience of the knowledge of you know the wisdom that our, our trainers have, we want to be able to also cultivate that listening, you know, to really being open. Can we listen to ourselves and to our trainer instead of straight away going into our head, having a conversation about it? Can we stay open? Um, so in essence, what I'm talking about is for students, it's very important to take responsibility for their learning. That is not the responsibility of the trainer. That is the responsibility of the student. And stepping into that responsibility means that you do your research too. You think about what your horse needs too. You think about what you need. You, you know, you actively participate in that process. If we just pitch up at the time that we were supposed to be already on the horse and and just do our lesson and then think that we are a good student, it's it's not about being good or bad, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's not enough. You know, if, if you just want to have a good time in that hour, it might be, but if you want to progress, if you want to improve, if you want to, you know, achieve certain ambitious goals, then I can tell you now that is not enough. You're going to have to dive into the work and that is uncomfortable. Like I said, any, any growth process is uncomfortable at times and yeah, you're going to have to be willing to be okay with that, to, to go through that, to feel that and, and to, to do the work. Hmm. We've talked so much in this conversation about connecting to who you really are hmm. um, and really connecting inward. What are the tools that we need to be able to do that when things, when we are in these transitional moments in whether it's in our relationship with our trainer, whether it's in our careers, whether it's in, um, as age, as we, you know, are at different ages in our lives, things feel more or less chaotic and transitional. Um, but those moments can feel so, um, so disconnected and so chaotic and so, so like, uh, you can't quite make sense of, of things. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why they say hindsight's twenty twenty. I think, because you, mm-hmm. you, you usually can mm-hmm. when you're out of it, but when you're in it, that's very, very difficult. Ah, you're in what? In, in your head. You're in yeah, your disconnect. Yeah. Well, in, in, in that chaotic state. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you said being out of it is very helpful, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, back in the day, I would practice and I would give a lot of tools. What I've learned over time is that tools are only successful if we use them. Mm-hmm. Now, If I'm not realizing that I'm in the chaos, that I'm in the stories that create the chaos, yeah, you can have all the tools in the world. You can have read all the self-help books that are out there, still not going to make any difference. And so I think what is more crucial, uh, not even important, but what is crucial is that we start to... um, tune into consistently that inner being and we don't need tools for that we just need to do it like the the suggestion i made earlier the sitting down with yourself you don't need time for that people might give you uh, you know tons of excuses why they couldn't or can't or shouldn't do this exercise and it's not even an exercise um this morning i was listening to something that came up and it started with a quote oh, that was it, a meditation I followed and it started with a quote from Rumi and it said there is a voice internally 
that is not spoken in words. Listen. When we tune into that and we get really quiet, we create that space to know what to do. However, we are not taught that. We're so taught to find tools, to do the exercises, to, um, to, to achieve, that we're constantly running after something. And what I'm suggesting is to actually slow down enough to step out of the situation into your true self. And everything, the answers are there. Your answers are there. My answers are there. When we tune in, and the same happens when we tune into our horse, the answers are there, but we do need to listen. Mm. So I suggest that we, instead of thinking of tools, that we start thinking about being that person that trusts her or himself enough to create a few minutes here and there and throughout to keep tuning in, to dare to slow down, to really listen. That makes all the difference. That's scary. <laughs> I, 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 think yes. you, I think you have, um, have uh, intuited this about, about me from uh, a reprimand that you gave me on our first call together. <laughs> which I loved, um, that I am one of those people who is like a, an, a, a fast achievement, do, do, do kind of, um, person. And, you know, as we were, as we were talking, you were like, I can hear you like clacking away on your keyboard. <laughs> just mad, you're like, very, mad. you're very silent. You're like, mm, if I just do it like very quietly, she won't notice. Um, we do though. <laughs> and mm, I think that in, in sports and in, in life, um, you know, we're, we're taught this and I'm not, I, I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong because there certainly is a place for it, but we're mm -hmm. taught that doing and being on top of things and being proactive and being yeah. aggressive and being yeah. that, that, that is the edge yeah yeah and that's what they have at the top mm -hmm. or that's what that person has mm -hmm. who's three three positions up the leaderboard that's mm -hmm. what they have that i don't mm -hmm. and you're sort of flipping that a little bit on its head mm -hmm. and saying that's probably if you've gotten to this certain point that's probably not what you're lacking the thing is, it might be, it might not. It really depends on the person, on the moment, on the, the horse, on the... You cannot just say, okay, here, if you go straight and then you turn left and at the green light, you have to stop and then continue. It doesn't... Success doesn't work that way. I can't tell you exactly what you need to succeed in that moment. Only you can. Mm -hmm. And so... Learning to tune in is what will give you the answer in that very moment, what is required. Sometimes what's required is for you to take action and action and action. And sometimes what's required in that moment is to actually slow down and rest. And sometimes what's required is to, uh, to really dig in and to go deep. And sometimes what's required is to really just lean into trust. Now, I cannot tell you what you need in whatever moment, because only you know. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we start to really listen instead of to other people, also to ourselves. And mm -hmm. to cultivate that, that we are that person that dares to really tune in, listen, and from there, we can see, okay, what's required and what do the people who have already achieved what I want to achieve, what are they doing? You can take that into account. Of course you do. You need to. It's not the only thing. We need to also learn, and that's what I'm experiencing working with the top writers in the sport, is that more often than not, it's not about 
working harder when they ask their head it's like oh i need to really work out in the gym more or i need to eat healthier i need to do this and that and yes though that will really create the conditions for great performance and for consistency it is not enough if let's say you get to those olympic games and you are there and you've had an amazing diet the whole year and you've gone to the gym consistently and you've done everything right and yet in that moment we're not able to really or just not realizing that we're not really tuning in and listening that we need to just quiet down a little there's so much noise there's so much going on everybody suddenly wants something from us our ego is like boosted and feeling amazing and yet what's required to stay consistent in that week very important week is to tune in is to listen to dare to 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 really slow down enough and to be quiet enough and that can make all the difference and that is what i'm suggesting it's not that it's either one or the other it's and and so connection and that peace and that stillness and ambition can exist in the same person. I think they work extremely well together. Mm. Yes. Feeling great where you are today and incredibly driven and excited to get to reach even more goals. Wow. What a combination that is. Yeah. But starting from a place of I am not enough. And once I achieve that, then I'll feel good enough. Usually that does not work. It doesn't create the success we want. And even when we do get the success we want, just like Andrea Agassi, like Michael Phelps, we, we can fall into deep depression because we don't achieve that feeling that we thought we would. And now what? Now we still feel empty or even emptier. Mm. And so it's, it's about feeling already enough today and then to keep chasing bigger dreams. I believe that that is what we're here for, to do, to keep evolving, to keep stretching, to keep learning and growing. Annette, your, your beautiful hair is just starting to bump your mic again. So just oh. tuck it back behind your ear. <laughs> back to you. One of the things that is so integral to a healthy student trainer relationship back to that idea is communication. Um, and as you said, respect, and sometimes maybe what this might look like or sort of the result of, I, I actually had a conversation on this podcast quite recently where I, um, was interviewing a professional writer who said, you know, I, I thought that I always wanted to you know, rock up to these shows with like a string of 10 horses and just have the grooms bring them to me. And I get on and I go and I, and, you know, I bring them back and I hand them off and I do the next one because that felt exciting and that felt sexy. And that felt like the, the dream. Um, and then she had that and she realized that's not actually at all what made her happy mm -hmm. that she would much rather have a few horses that she spends a lot of time with and mm. really connects deeply with mm -hmm. and that that also required her to let go of these goals and dreams that previously had supported that idea of what she thought she wanted. Mm -hmm. And that's something that as students and as trainers, I mean, every trainer has, has a trainer. <laughs> so we're all mm -hmm. students really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as students, we have to be able to communicate this metamorphosis to our trainer. It's, it's counterproductive to your goals, to your horse, to your relationship with your trainer, to your entire existence in the sport. If you can't say, I know we have been, you know, really focused on this developing this side of me or this goal or this picture or making it to these medal finals and and you know maybe we still do that but and and i'm interested in exploring this other side of me where i'm finding i have a lot of 
glimmers of happiness Mm -hmm. and where I find that that interconnection comes more naturally. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is a conversation probably with a trainer. Maybe sometimes that means that you start working with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Those are hard conversations to have. Mm -hmm. Yep. How do we have them? By starting. Just doing it. By doing it. Yeah. There is no other way, right? By by starting the conversation. And um, again, if we have already a relationship based on respect, there is a, a much greater chance that you feel heard as a student. And that is also, again, leads to a greater likelihood that you're willing to share what's on your mind right so again you know respect being respectful enough to share what's on your mind again that too is respect uh if we keep it in and leave the the trainer in the dark Mm. it it, it's that is you know the responsibility we have as a student is to be respectful too in that way it's it not is your a trainer's responsibility to read your mind. That's no, not fair. No, and, and it's it's also not his responsibility to reach your goals and your dreams. It's mm-hmm. yours, right? So we have to step up. And if we find it uncomfortable to have those kind of conversations, that's normal. And you're going to have to do it anyway. Okay, Because, again, uh, that too is, is part of that process of stepping into who you really are and d- daring to own it. Yeah, I want to spend more time with my horses. And then it's up to, again, the also the, the, the trainer and, again, the, the level of respect that he respects your goals above his own. I think that is really critical. That will allow you the space to do so. And if there is not that space or the trainer decides, I hear you, I really respect that, I encourage it, and then I'm not the right coach for you. That mm-hmm. is very respectful too, right? So these are maybe tough conversations. And, and at the same time, we learn so much from them. Even if it's just that process of going through that ourselves, starting with, you know, I have clients who know they should talk to their trainer and they procrastinate and procrastinate and procrastinate because it's scary. And in the meantime, we build this huge story in our head about what it's going to be like and how they're going to respond and da da da. And, and as a result, we, we kind of, how can we really be ourselves if we're not daring to step into it and communicate it? So somehow it already there, you not owning up and not daring to speak your truth is already diminishing your power. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh. So absolutely. Like Mm. nail on the head. Okay. And I think, you know, something that I've sort of picked up over time, just, you know, doing this podcast and having these types of conversations, some of which have been hard is naming that it it is uncomfortable. That's okay to do. That is, it is okay to lead with that vulnerability of saying, this is hard for me to say to you. Yes. Yes. And I, that is what I meant when I talked about this is what the sport needs to evolve, is we need to dare to be vulnerable that way. And that allows us to really be who we really are. And instead of being that image of that we, we thought we should be or wanted to be like the, the lady or the, the, the person you spoke to recently about having these 10 horses and rocking up and it looks sexy. And then realizing like, actually, that is not who I am. And that's not what makes me happy. And that's okay, because only through exploring it, doing it, we learn, right? And we can adjust at any moment. There is no shame in that. In fact, I encourage it. We as a 16 year old don't know exactly what we want to do, where we want to be, who we want to be. It can't be. We can only find that out through doing, through exploring, through daring, being brave enough to step into it and do it. 
And as we go, we can fail and we can adjust. It's not even failure, really. It's just about, ooh, that's, that wasn't it. And we adjust again. And yeah, I think that that is extremely brave. Being vulnerable is brave. And this is exactly why speaking to the top writers in the show jumping sport was so eye-opening for me it was because they actually were vulnerable and they were very open and that was a side to them that I'd never seen before and because I saw that side to them it gave me an idea of okay we can all be that we can all get there and and do those things and it, we don't all have the same ambitions and the same goals and dreams. A lot of us think we do, but when we get closer and realize what it takes, we, we realize actually that isn't me. And that's totally fine. I thought until I was about 20, 22, even, you know, I I'd started uh, studying applied psychology. I still thought I would just be the, a writer, you know, that would be my profession for the rest of my life. And yet, you know, at some point I realized I have to listen to this inner voice that tells me we need to make an adjustment and that's okay. Hmm. You have worked with your own coach. So you have been a student and you've been a coach. You've been on sort of both sides of the coin. Oh yes. I've worked with many coaches. (laughs) What, what do you feel like that experience being in like the student's seat and bearing witness to the experiences of the unexpected experiences of all of these amazing elite athletes. What do you think that it's taught you about yourself and about human nature? Wow. How do I answer that in one, one answer? (laughs) Um, I guess what I, what I just spoke about, the fact that becoming ourselves, just like uh, Michelle Obama called her book Becoming, she said, like, you're, you're not a finished product when you're born, right? We, we constantly evolve. And so do the top writers. And so do I, you know, my best self today is no longer my best self in in five years from now, in 10 years from now, not even in one year from now, because I keep doing that work. I keep working with coaches. I keep doing that internal work, not from a place of judging like that is right, that is wrong, but from a place of where else can I go deeper? Where else can I evolve? Where else can I do even better um and not as a as a place of i'm not good enough now but from a place of um there there is always that space to to grow and and again that is my responsibility for myself and for my clients um to keep doing that work and just the, the fact that I keep showing up every two weeks to my coach's session um, means that I keep listening and I keep observing where, you know, what, what's working for me and what's not working. Where do I need to make the corrections and the adjustments? And as a result, I can do the same for my clients. And more often than not, what I'm learning at this stage in my life anyway, is that, again, it's about daring to trust, to tune in for me too. Hey, I'm there with you. I too find this extremely hard still after 20 plus years to sit down and get still. It, it still is work for me too. Mm. And yet, it is doing it that makes the difference. And so, yeah, I keep, uh, it's not even working on myself. It's, 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 it's just um, being consistent with that process of, of um, growth, really. 
And what I've learned from the top writers is that I believe in their way, they do the same. They have always been very open to learn, to observe. And I I read a quote from John Whitaker the other day that said, back in the day, we watched other writers to learn. Nowadays, the young generation watches their phone. And I thought that was funny, but also quite, you know, telling. When I spoke to um, a lot of these writers for the book, like Lorenzo De Luca, Daniel Doiser, McLean Ward, they all told me that, you know, as young people, and still today, they said, they, they, they keep you know, key in a corner, they keep their eyes open, they keep learning. And it's not just about learning about how they ride their horses, but it's also about so much more than that. Like how, how do you become successful and how do you stay consistently successful in whatever field that might be, whatever goals you might have, how can you stay consistent in that? And uh, if you're not willing to, to learn, from either yourself or from others and you just you know d- go back to the full mode of i'm just this way then you will also get what you're getting right now it's very simple and if you're happy with that great keep doing what you're doing if you're not happy with that it's on you yep <laughs> Annette, at the end of every episode, we do something called Three Little Things. And you've given us much more than three little things um, in this episode. You've given us a hundred big things. But um, I like to give people as a parting gift, low barrier, low cost, low or no cost things that anyone can do today Mm. to make themselves just a little bit better. Mm. I want to know three little things that we can do to become more connected to ourselves Mm -hmm. or be better students of the sport? Mm -hmm. Um, One, like I've said many times today already, you can feel it coming. (laughs) Tune in and listen, get quiet. It might not be quiet straight away. Yeah, you might start hearing loads more at first. Don't be discouraged, just sit with it. Notice the discomfort and stay with it and listen and just keep doing that and that doesn't cost you anything it doesn't even cost you time if you say i don't have five minutes on 24 hours you don't have a life i'm sure you if you have five minutes for social media you can make five minutes for this right so that's one two is do the same and now for your horses take a few minutes every day to get still ground yourself first And then tune into your horse. Really, either you're there next to them or in your mind's eye. You might be in hospital, injured. Yeah, you can still connect. Mm. And this is maybe a concept that we we often forget about, but we can actually, we, we just need to connect in our mind's eye. We see our horse and we connect and we just tune in. What does my horse need? What, what you know what's going on for my horse and just with that respect and curiosity tuning in i think again it, it, those are two parts of the equation of the rider and horse relationship both are equally important so those are things that you you want to invest in first and foremost above, before all the bits and the equipment and all of that is really fun but you know what that is not crucial to success. What is crucial is that you really listen. That's first. And then, um, you know, keep learning. Of course, uh, next to that, it's keep evolving your mind, keep training your brain, your focus, your ability to be present, which you're doing with the first and the second exercise I just gave you. And um, reading, read my book, Winning Habits, keep doing the master classes on Noel Floyd. All of those are incredibly valuable um, tools to, to keep yeah, um, evolving, to keep learning, to keep testing the theories that you had, if they still work for you now, you know, if we need to adjust those. Mm. Annette, it has been such a treat. Oh, man, it's been such a treat. Thank you so much. Thank you for being 
the calming presence that you are and also just the wealth of knowledge. I feel like uh, everyone who listens to this episode will be better for doing so. So thank you very much. Thank you, honestly, for giving that space and for listening. <laughs>